Hey there, interwebs. Last month's video was all about some of history's strangest non-combat swords, and in it I mentioned the fact that I had notes for other related swords which were cut from the final script. You can hopefully see where I'm going with this, so let's just jump right into it. For those curious, the blade portion, if you can even call it that, is the preserved rostrum of a sawfish, but this isn't the only type of sword made from the nose of a fish. Setting chondrichthyes aside, there is another taxon of marine vertebrates known as Istiophoroforms, or billfish, which is composed of two families, Istiophoridae and Ziphiidae. Of the twelve recognized species of billfish, eleven belong to the former, which includes marlins as well as the fastest recorded animal in the sea, the sailfish. The billfish in which we're interested today, however, is the sole living member of the monotypic Ziphiidae family, the swordfish, as if you hadn't already guessed. Its binomial designation is Ziphius gladius, which is a combination of Greek and Latin literally meaning sword-sword, just like how the brown bear's name Ursus arctos means bear-bear, and the American bison's name bison-bison means... actually, never mind. Obviously, the swordfish got its name for having a sword for a nose, but how would you like to have a nose for a sword? Just as with the sawfish, people have historically harvested the rostra of billfish for use as exotic weapons, some more functional than others. Of course, there are also plenty of other fish in the sea, and they can be difficult to neatly categorize. Two paragraphs ago, I remarked that billfish belong to the order Istiophoroforms, but not everyone agrees with this classification. The fifth and most recent edition of Fishes of the World lists it as a valid taxon, albeit including the barracuda family, while others classify billfish and barracudas as belonging to the suborder Scombroidae, alongside mackerel and tuna. These Piscine cousins don't come equipped with swords, but that's okay, because Japanese fishmongers bring their own. Strictly speaking, that's not entirely true. The Magoro Bocho, as it's called, isn't a sword intended for combat, because it's neither a sword, nor was it ever intended to be wielded in anger. Its name is Japanese, literally meaning tuna knife, because it's intended for cutting up fish. On the other hand, these knives are significantly larger than many historical sword designs, such as the Greek Xiphos and the famous Roman Gladius, from which the swordfish takes its scientific name. The German Golsus Messer's name also means big knife, as does the Chinese Da Dao, and more on that in a moment, but those two weapons are absolutely swords, so I don't place too much stock in names alone. Whether you consider it a sword-sized knife or a knife-like sword, take your pick, the Magoro Bocho is undeniably intended for cutting up fish, not people. That being said, this hasn't stopped the Yakuza from finding new and creative uses on that front. Bearing swords weren't the only giant swords in history, however. The Zhang Madao originated in China during the Han Dynasty, but didn't reach the height of its popularity until the Song Dynasty, roughly 750 years later. It may have also given rise to the Changdao, the Wodao, and the Miaodao, as well as the Japanese Zambato, and possibly the Odachi or Nodachi. I'd go into the differences, but trying to cleanly separate these East Asian swords is on par with defining the distinctions between longswords, two-handed swords, war swords, and great swords in European armories. Suffice to say, these Chinese arms were large, single-edged weapons that blurred the line between swords and polearms, and unlike most of the swords in this video, they were actually used on other humans in combat. That just wasn't their primary intended purpose. If you want to chop a dude up, you don't need nearly such a large blade, so what was this huge beast of a blade used for? Actually, calling it a beast is a subtle hint. A much less subtle hint is the direct translation of its name, horse chopping knife, or saber. In truth, the Chinese word dao is often either left untranslated or rendered as knife, but I have also seen saber and simply sword given as acceptable interpretations as well. In general, the word basically just means blade, specifically one which is single-edged. Size doesn't really factor into it, as we can clearly see with this so-called horse chopping knife. Regardless of how you want to interpret the latter portion of its name, the first part tells us these were anti-cavalry weapons, made for chopping through equine appendages like legs or necks. Once a soldier had cut his way through the horse, the unmounted rider was next. I have even heard rumors of a legendary three-head chopping weapon, which severed three heads in one swing. Those of the horse, its rider, and his lance. Whether or not this actually happened in reality is doubtful, but I did say it was a legendary weapon. In more mundane applications, the Jean Nadao and its relatives were definitely more anti-horse weapons than anti-man weapons, even if they were used against both. That's like shooting an enemy soldier with a 50 caliber anti-materiel rifle, because there's no kill like overkill. If theatrical swallowing swords take the phrase conspicuous consumption a little too literally for your taste, you could also have an equally blunt sword made from cold hard cash. Specifically, the traditional Chinese coins called cash, also known as qian. These coins were used as currency for more than 2,000 years, from the mid-4th century BC to the early 20th century AD. 
Interestingly, their direct precursor was Chinese knife money, which functioned like the African spear money or Mesoamerican axe monies mentioned previously, meaning they too were non-combat oriented blades. These days, cash coins are used primarily as good luck tokens, hung as pendants around children's necks or over the beds of the old or infirm. Many of them may also be bound together to create a sword-shaped wand, and these numismatic talismans are used in the practice of feng shui to ward off evil spirits. Counterintuitively, these supposed apotropaic powers are not believed to stem from the symbolic monetary value of the coins used in the amulet's construction, but rather from the title of the imperial era stamped on them, with coins minted during more prosperous eras considered to be more powerful. This is also part of the reason why proper cash swords should be made entirely from coins all minted during the same era, thus bearing matching inscriptions. These objects were most often hung on walls, especially above doors, windows, and beds to defend against Chinese cacodemons rather than humans, but they're not really swords, just sword-like objects. Of course, they're not the only wall hangers we can apply that label to. Next up is the scythe sword, although its inclusion on this list may prove controversial. A scythe sword is, as its name implies, a sword made from a scythe. Specifically, the blade of the agricultural implement is refitted with a sword's hilt, and I personally believe these creations were exclusively symbolic. You see, in order to be effective and efficient at cutting grass, the blade of a scythe must be wafer-thin, like the blade of a box cutter. Now imagine if you made a box cutter as big as a sword and tried using it to hit a hard target, such as a shield or armored opponent. That'd be the end of your sword, so I suspect the scythe sword was never used as a weapon in actual combat. The lone surviving historical example we have of one was owned by Thomas Münzer during the German Peasants' Revolt of 1525. Just looking at it, we can see that its edge is on the wrong side. It's on the reverse concave side. Now, that's not to say concave-edged blades can't be effective. The Dacian Falx, for example, was so brutally effective that the Roman Empire supposedly redesigned the helmets of their soldiers to better withstand its blows, but look at Münzer's sword closely. Specifically, look at its handle. In order for the knuckle chain to actually be in front of the user's knuckles and not getting in the way of the wrist, the user would have to hold it with the sole edge toward themselves. Admittedly, it isn't the only historical blade to sport this unusual feature. Some Confederate Bowie knives were also reverse-edged, and the design of the so-called sword breaker began as a double-edged parrying dagger, which then had teeth placed on its forward edge to trap an opponent's weapon, making it reverse-edged by default. That being said, these are both fighting knives, and you use a knife differently to how you'd use a sword. Allegedly, the typical way to use a reverse-edged bowie knife was to make a low, underhand thrust into the guts, then drag the blade up and out. You could certainly try this with a side sword, but I suspect it would be prohibitively awkward. The blade of Mincer's sword is also incised with a runic calendar, also known as a runic almanac, which is a tool for calculating and keeping track of lunar cycles. In addition to being a bit of fancy decoration, this is a handy thing to have if you're a farmer, which brings us back to my theory that this was a symbolic weapon. After all, if you're leading a peasant farmer's revolt, what better weapon to use than a sword made from a scythe blade? I mean, besides a gooden disc, obviously. While particularly large blades combine elements of swords and polearms, other weapons combine swords and guns, and they're usually termed gun blades or gun swords, although the blades of most historical examples were too small to be considered true swords. Of course, I say most, not all. We can find pictures of sword-sized blades with attached single-shot flintlock pistols, pinfire revolvers, and even a Type 14 Nambu automatic pistol, although whether or not that last example was ever functional remains a mystery. By 1842, Sam Colt patented a cutlass revolver intended for U.S. naval use, but the name cutlass was a bit of an overstatement. The piece was essentially a six-shot revolver with a large knife attached. It's likely that Colt was attempting to piggyback on the 1838 adoption of the single-shot Elgin cutlass pistol. Its adoption, by the way, means that the very first percussion gun ever officially procured by the U.S. military was a gun blade. Neat. And what's more, just the preceding year, the Norwegian Postal Service issued the Postforerverger, or Postman Guardian, which was basically a knife with two pistols attached. Insert your own going postal joke here. To cut a long history short, gun blades have existed for nearly as long as guns themselves have, and examples are still being produced today, but they've never really taken off in popularity. This is almost certainly because most people who are looking for a weapon they'd feel comfortable trusting their life with recognize that these aren't the most practical option. On the other hand, gun blades have existed for nearly as long as guns themselves have, and examples are still being produced today because nearly everyone recognizes that they're just so damn cool. People have liked nifty gadgets since the dawn of humanity, and I suspect that's what many of the more heavily embellished examples were. Lastly, I leave you with the great American corn sword, because nothing screams America quite like a bald eagle and corn. Thanks for watching, and have a nice day.